Jesus said, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever does not enter a sheepfold through the gate, but climbs over elsewhere, is a thief and a robber. But whoever enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice as the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has driven out all his own, he walks ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. But they will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of strangers. Although Jesus used this figure of speech, the Pharisees did not realize what he was trying to tell them. So Jesus said again, Amen, amen, I say to you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us today. The Gospel of the Good Shepherd, the one who leads us where we need to go. Whenever I read this Gospel, I'm reminded of someone that in my own mind is probably one of those saints who was never ever recognized and never will be recognized, but a very, very holy man that I had the opportunity to meet. Many years ago, I was a pastor down the bayou and the main industry of the area is sugarcane. And so every year at the beginning of the harvest season, they call grinding, we would have a mass in the sugar house, in the mill, bless all the equipment, bless the workers, pray for safety, health, and a good grinding season. The very first year I did it, there was an elderly gentleman who worked in, in the coffee shop and made me look up a cup of coffee. He said, you the priest at that church over there? I said, yeah, I'm the priest. He introduced himself and introduced himself as Mr. Ed White. Well, Mr. Ed White said, well, I don't go to that church. I go to the neighboring church five miles down. And we got to visiting and everything. And he said, well, he said, Father, he said, I, I, I've never had my house blessed. Would you come and bless my house? I said, oh, Mr. Ed, I'd be delighted to, okay? Anyway, uh, he, you know, out in the country, you really don't have addresses. You know, you got to turn by the house with the red rocking chairs on the porch. You got it turned by the, the tractor that was left in the field, you know, that sort of thing. Well, I finally, you know, turn on, on the right road down in the middle of a cane field and I arrive at Mr. Ed's house and he's on the porch waiting for me and bless his heart, you'd have thought the Pope was coming. He was all excited. He had made coffee and everything and I greet him on the porch and I, I go in his house and you, you walk into a living room and there's a picture of Jesus, the good shepherd. And he's got a chair and he's got a little, a little old television in there and everything. And right off of that room, he said, oh, you got to see my altar. And so I go in there and he's got this altar built in the room. And it's some of the ugliest artwork you've ever seen in your life. It's a type of felt drawings, you, you know, you buy on the side of the road in Mexico and you turn Jesus one way and he's 
suffering on the cross. He turned him another way and he's resurrected from the dead. It was really tacky stuff, but it was a, it, it, it was a basilica. It was a basilica of faith. He had all kind of religious objects in there. And it, it was tiered, you know, three or four tiers up. And in the tiers, I saw school children of all these different school children pictures all over the place, you know, 20 or 30 of them and everything. And so, you know, and of course he had in there the good shepherd. And then he shows me his little simple bedroom with a little single bed in it. And again, a picture of Jesus and the good shepherd. And we finally go in the kitchen where he's made coffee and there's, you know, a, a little table, one chair or two chairs for me. And then Jesus and the good shepherd. And I said, Mr. Ed, you got all these images of Jesus, a good shepherd. And I said, why? And he looked at me just as sincere. He said, because that's what I does. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, that's what I does. I'm the good shepherd. Now, he began to tell me the story. Ed was obviously born out of wedlock, and he, his mother had two children, never married, and he was born out of wedlock, and his older sister was kind of slow, not that bright, but in the meantime, his older sister gave birth to six children, and those six children gave birth to children, and they were all living in that little area out in the middle of a cane field. And I said, well, Mr. Ed, you got all these school pictures in your altar. He said, that's my children. That's what I does. I take care of them. I take care of them, and I make sure they, they, they have what they need. Now, here's a man who can't read and write, has worked in his cane field all of his life, and he worked to make sure that 26 children went to school and got an education. He can't drive a car because he can never pass, you know, a driving test since he doesn't read, but he's got this old bike and he's got about a five mile ride between his house, first on a dusty dirt road then on a two-lane asphalt highway to get to the church that he goes to every Sunday. And Mr. Ed, don't miss Mass. He's never missed Mass. And I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's freezing. Mr. Ed does not miss Mass. And he's got a raincoat that he uses that he can ride his bicycle with. And then afterwards, he goes to Mass. He goes to Big B Superette, and he buys his groceries for the week. And then he puts them in his basket, and he goes home. And someone from the sugar mill picks him up for work every day because that's what he does. And... Now, as I introduced Mr. Ed White, this is one of the saints that the Roman church will never ever come to know. But this is a person who lived his life and laid down his life for the sake of others. In the course of telling me the story, his mother died. He took care of it until she died. And of course, he couldn't afford a funeral, but he was able to get a body bag and bury her in the backyard. And he showed me his mother's grave and the cross and everything like that. His sister, who had limited mental faculties, was smoking in bed and fell asleep and burned down his first house that he had to then rebuild. And he spent his life 
trying to teach those children, trying to teach those children right from wrong and make sure they got a good education because he didn't have one and he knew how hard that was to live in a world without education. I tell that story of Mr. Ed White because many of you probably have your own stories. Many of you probably have come from immigrant families whose parents came to this country with nothing but a small suitcase and the clothes on their back and they worked hard and they wanted their children to have what they never had. As they say in the country, they work from can to can, from the moment you can see to the moment you can't see. They worked long hours. Many of them lived either above or behind the place where they worked. And they made great sacrifice. And the two things that they insisted their children have was first of all, faith. They wanted to make sure that their children knew that God was going to take care of them. And you got to know God. And they were grateful coming from the old country. And even though their standard of living was less than so many other people around him, they were very grateful that they could earn a living and they could provide for their children and they could support their church. If you don't believe me, just go into a lot of our large inner city areas and you'll find these Polish churches and German churches and Irish churches and French churches and Italian churches, magnificent structures that they built to honor God. But you go in the neighborhood and the neighborhood is little cardboard houses almost. They weren't fancy neighborhoods. There weren't mansions in that neighborhood. There were simple little shotgun, little wood frame houses that they built to take care of themselves and their family. But when it came to God, they gave the very best that they had. The churches were magnificent. Their homes were adequate. And it's a mentality about being the good shepherd and sacrificing for your sheep and giving your very life so that they have what we never had. Then we're the recipients. I'm second generation Lebanese. And we're the recipients of those people who came in and made the sacrifice in order that we might have life and have it more abundantly and have more opportunity. Unfortunately, the second and third generations have not done well with their wealth and prosperity. They become too important and too busy for God. That's not what our shepherds intended. We'll talk more about that when we come back. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today. And a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor driven, and that would, is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply. And mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly, we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court. We stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. The shepherd walks ahead of them 
and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. But they will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of strangers. Although Jesus uses figure of speech, the Pharisees did not realize what he was trying to tell them. Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Barry, your host, and we're glad that you came back. But the Pharisees did not realize what they were trying to tell them. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. I mean, but, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're really good people. I know they're living in this situation. I know they don't do this. I know they don't go to church. I know they're involved in this. But, you know, they're really, really good people. I'm the last one to judge someone's heart. What's in our heart, what's in our mind, is known to God and God alone. But our Lord does talk about his sheep, the ones who recognize his voice, and the ones who recognize his voice are the ones who follow him. And what does it mean to follow the good shepherd? Can I completely ignore his teachings and say, but I'm a good person and I'm a believer and I think we ought to do this or we ought to do that, but I don't follow where he leads. This is not about judgment. This is about a reality check. You know, one of the challenges that I've had in my 44 years of priesthood and probably much more here recently is the idea that young couples who've been living together one, two, three years, whatever, come to you and they say they want to get married. Okay, good. You know, do you go to church? Well, sometimes, but not like we should. Okay. How long have you been living together? And they give an amount of time. And I said, well, why do you want to get married in the church? Well, we think it's important. We think it's important that God recognizes our marriage and we want God to recognize our marriage. And so the next question that follows, and you can probably guess before I tell you, is well then how do you reconcile how you're living right now to God's law and asking him to bless you? You know, the fact that you're doing something that is contrary to God's law and living in a way that God does not approve, and then one morning you get out of bed and you're going to rent a tux and some patent leather shoes and you're going to get a dress that you can't afford, you can come stand before me and I do this and now all of a sudden something that's sinful is automatically holy. I don't have that kind of power. I really don't. And if you want to continue living in such a manner that you ignore the law of God, but you're asking me to bless it, I can't do that. I'm a witness in, in the sacrament of marriage. You're the ordinary ministers. I'm a witness in the sacrament of marriage. And I'm not going to stand up and witness something that, according to God's law and according to his teaching, is sinful 
and you can ask me to witness and say it's holy. I can't do that. And then I'll ask them, are they willing to make some changes? Or are they willing to either separate, move out, if financially that's not a possibility? Are you willing at this point to make a commitment? No longer to live conjugally as husband and wife between now and your marriage? And are you willing to be able to go to confession, be free of sin, and then be married, living according to God's law? We all make mistakes. Don't worry. I'm, I'm certainly not, not one who can say I've never made mistakes. I've made plenty. And so have you. But if you want to bring it before God, we got to play by his rules and not our own. And you know, most of the time when you present it like that, they'll buy into it. A couple have told me, no, you know where you can go. Well, you know, then go somewhere else. I'm, I'm not going to witness something that you're not willing to try to correct in the sight of God. And most of them will say, you know, we'll do it. We can't afford to move. Okay. I'm not going to do bed check. But if you make a commitment towards God and you promise to live according to his law prior to your marriage, if you break that, that's on, that's on you. But for me, I need to know that before I'll witness your wedding. And our Lord said the Pharisees knew what the good shepherd was talking about. They, they knew that they were leading them into an area that was not of God. I would love to say that all religions who read from the same Bible are on the same page when it comes to the law of God. Not so. There are a lot of voices out there right now. There are a lot of strangers who in the name of God are leading the sheep off a cliff and saying this is okay. Now please understand when I say this that, you know, and I always think about the, the woman at the well who had had, you know, five husbands or the one she was living with was not her husband and that sort of thing. Always think about that. And our Lord didn't say, hey, honey, you're going to hell. Get away from me. God didn't deal with her that way. God led her back to the path of salvation. But when we go out as priests, as ministers, as rabbis, as imams or whatever, shamans, whoever you are, when we take the law of God and we misrepresent God and we lead our people away from God and we're more concerned about social conventions of the day when we're more concerned about popular thought and we lead the people of God into directions that are contrary to the law of God. Something's really wrong. Something's really wrong. When you have churches who will say, you know what? It's not a child. It's a choice. And a woman has domain over her own body. I believe that that a woman has control over her own body. She has control so that she doesn't end up engaging in what's necessary to have a child. She has control over that. But once there's a child that's been conceived, she doesn't have control over that child. That's been conceived by God. I believe that you can love whoever you want to love. 
And I believe that men can love men. And I believe that women can love women. And, but I don't believe we can violate the gift of human sexuality that God created in order for us to procreate by using it recreationally or simply as a form of my own pleasure. And when you start to look at another human being as an object for your pleasure, you're downgrading the integrity of the human person and you're using it as a matter of profit, pleasure, or possession. And that's a very dangerous place to be when we talk about the gift of human life that we start to think we can own or we can possess or we can simply look at someone recreationally because that would bring me great pleasure to engage in certain activities. And when we find ourselves as a church saying things like human sexuality has evolved and the law that Christ gave is no longer relevant because Christ didn't know what we now know about human life and human sexuality and we've evolved past the law of God? Baby, I don't want to be on that train. I don't want to be on that train. And when we can say that we think when God created them male and female, he made a mistake because this four-year-old or this five-year-old should have been different or should have been other, we're really really becoming very pharisaical. We're no longer following the law of God. We're following the law of the stranger, which makes the sheep run away. And they do run, and they run in all different directions. And when they do it in the name of religion, because there has been a false shepherd, we're really, really in a very dangerous territory. I was never ordained to preach my opinion. I was ordained to preach the law of God that comes to me through Holy Mother Church. Anything short of that is my own self-worship. Follow the Good Shepherd. We thank you for being with us. May each day, day bring you close in your walk with the Lord. God bless. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Join us here in this station each week as we strive to bring you the gospel message with great clarity and great charity. And may God bless you in your walk each day.